just, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Is it good? Along those lines, maybe we can switch a little bit. You can stay in Tucson yeah. for, the, <laughs> for the summer. Okay, uh, so yeah, my talk is going to be on dynamics. Uh, it's chaotic quest to conquer Earth space junk problem. I took this title from a Nature News piece uh, that, that featured some work by myself, uh, Marie Bajaz, is a big figure in the in the field, uh, and another professor. So this is going to be a talk primarily about ways to clean up uh, the space junk problem, but from a, a kind of academic perspective. Um, the, I, the area that I work in is mostly called astrodynamics. It's the study of the orbital motion of, of man-made objects, so about orbital motion about the Earth or uh, spacecraft uh, going to other planets or other bodies. Uh, since the attention of most dynamical astronomers in the past really three decades has been focused upon the apparently inexhaustible realm of small bodies, more recently on the dynamicist playground of exoplanets so they can you know, do all kinds of different simulations, almost unbounded uh, things. I think the attention uh, uh, has, you know, uh, has been that you know, the orbital motion about Earth is not seen really as, uh, as having much excitement anymore uh, in terms of uh, from its astronomical heritage. So it was really sort of reinvigorated celestial mechanics in the Sputnik era and uh, sort of died down. But uh, fortunately, um, with uh, space debris, so one of the positive things from an astronomics point of view is that it, uh, the proliferation of this junk around Earth has motivated new, more fundamental, deeper studies into the orbital motion. Uh, and I think I like this quote here by Slavomir Breiter, who is a dynamical astronomer in Poland. Uh, in contrast to a widespread cliche, the satellite problem still requires the research on a level more fundamental than just tracing uh, uh, the microscopic influence of another Tesla harmonic. So this is another aspect of the gravity field of the Earth, so minute contributions if you keep adding higher and higher orders. Um, so we've been launching satellites for 60 years, but as strange as it may seem, we actually understand uh, the mostly invisible trans-Neptunian belts of small bodies far better than we understand the, the objects that orbit our uh, terrestrial abode. So before I get into this, this is my, uh, my sort of my chaotic path uh, into academia. I started out with um, doing my PhD at the University of Colorado with Dan Shears, who works uh, broadly uh, in the field of celestial mechanics. Um, it's part of the OSIRIS-REx asteroid uh, uh, retrieval mission. Uh, sample return mission, and uh, I did my postdoc, sort of a European Mediterranean tour uh, from Italy to uh, Greece, and I worked with a number of dynamical astronomers um, uh, that primarily focused their research on asteroid dynamics and uh, uh, mathematicians as well, and eventually I got to the Aristotle University of, of Thessaloniki, so I, I admit, admittedly I took the last gig just so I can list Aristotle on my uh, CV, um, but there's an interesting sort of dynamical um, uh, uh, feature that all of this, uh, all of my mentors have shared, and it turns out they all have asteroids named in their honor. Uh, and this is some kind of designation that you get when you've done some type of contribution in this, in this area. And I, and I think if I were going to sort of, as a dynamicist, project my own future, I think one day I will have my, my name on an asteroid. And I thank my niece for the, for the bitmoji. OK. so. Uh, Broadly speaking, my area is space flight, applied mechanics, and orbital systems. Uh, this is my lab, Samos, because I also like Greece. Uh, and Samos is the island that, uh, where many of the Greek dynamical astronomers originated. So Aristarchus um, was one of the first dynamical astronomers. So I sort of taken that, uh, built it into an acronym. Everybody has to have a lab in America, apparently, with a unique name. So mine is uh, Samos here. And what we do is we actually leverage uh, a lot of the work that's been done in dynamical astronomy uh, and as well as the fields of astrodynamics and sort of uh, find those, those connections really for the problems posed by space situational awareness. So what I do is a lot of fundamental and applied theoretical research in astrodynamics uh, and, and more recently in dynamical astronomy. And I leverage a lot of the advances that have been done in, um, in nonlinear uh, dynamics, uh, what we call uh, dynamical systems theory, uh, really to solve these space situational awareness issues that are really of critical national and uh, global importance. Uh, and I think this is important that, that, that this practical problem serves as the, uh, as the impetus of my work because all new concepts, theories, and methods have these really clearly defined requirements and uh, realistic expectations. And uh, one of the early astrodynamicists, uh, Malcolm Schuster, once wrote that the most important quality of good research is that it helps others while that rather than satisfying one's own intellectual gratification. And you can keep working out those microscopic influence. And it's kind of a, you know, very interesting, but it doesn't really do much to contribute. So some level it's got to be motivated by a very practical topic, especially if you're trying to get funding. 
which is really what we do. <laughs> uh, so, um, so we're going to see a, a, an increase in the uh, number of objects uh, that we're tracking. Currently, we track about 20,000 that's in the public catalog. But uh, once the space uh, fence radar becomes online, which who knows when that's going to be, it's like the, what was the 787 was always set, 7 late 7 was delayed so many years, it's like the space fence will never really be put up. But once it does, we're going to see a tenfold increase in the number of debris. So those objects are out there, but we can't track them yet. So they're, they're about below the size of a softball, so about centimeter to a softball size, and they can do damage to our space systems, but we can't see them. Uh, and this actually has a serious implication for a new emerging field called space traffic management. Um, and given uh, the fact that now the, the, you know, launching into space has become more cheap, uh, there's actually going to be an increased uh, 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 space traffic around the Earth, uh, especially with uh, the rise of these mega constellations you might have heard of that are going to give broadband internet to the, to the world. These are thousands, of, you know, SpaceX has a plan to launch 5,000 satellites in the, in the next year. That's more satellites than every nation has launched since the beginning of the space age. So, uh, and they're all going to be at the same altitude, so we'll see how that works. Um, so this is going to require radical improvements in this area of space situational awareness, which is really to detect, track, and identify all artificial orbiting objects. Uh, broadly speaking, this is the three pillars of my, my research area, and I'm going to focus on a number of these here. I just want to say, I know uh, Aaron um, in Vancouver, Aaron is going to be doing, um, having a telescope in Chile, so he'll be doing some observations. And that's one of the areas that I want to sort of get into, is actually getting into real uh, observations of, of space debris and satellites and sort of adapt a lot of the methods to, to doing this because when you use the public catalog the errors are something on the order of 10 kilometers in positional accuracy so if we say that one um, meter satellite is hitting another one or a piece of debris is going to hit another one uh, if they have a you know even a one kilometer error in their positional accuracy then you have a one in one million chance of an actual collision so it's not a very good uh, prediction and we'll see what that means so the number of collaborators uh, th that, um, that I've been working with over the years, and I'm going to focus a lot about the research of Jerome uh, Dekan, who's now in Padua, uh, Yana uh, Goyes and uh, Claudio Bombardelli, and also some colleagues and uh, students of mine at the University of Arizona. Um, and perhaps my oldest collaborator is 84, and we just submitted a, we just published a paper in a European Physics Journal together. So I worked with him, the oldest collaborator, 84, and uh, my youngest collaborator, my students. So it's kind of a nice bridge there. All right, so uh, really the ability to observe, assess, and characterize activity is essential in every domain, uh, but really given its vastness, uh, the remoteness and unforgiving nature of space, it's probably more significant there, and you've got to realize that space is non-discriminatory, so there's really no national airspace, there's no national space space, right? We'll have a space force, but what are we protecting? Um, but uh, one of the main things is to identify, characterize, and predict, and I highlight predict because I think it's the most important of these three areas, all the dynamics, uh, the dynamics of all objects orbiting Earth. Uh, I think this is a, a more than a, an engineering problem, it's more a broad scientific problem, and I think it's important to have that scientific mindset because it ties together theory, uh, observation, and simulation um, together, and in fact, uh, it fosters, um, um, it fosters a sort of uh, um, a, um, a realization of uh, different uh, fields uh, and how you can adapt other techniques into that. And there's actually quite a commonality between the Earth orbiter problem. There's a lot of parallels to understanding uh, the, the objects that orbit the Earth and to that of the objects that, uh, the, the asteroids that, that orbit the Sun. Uh, and in fact, this is an area that integrates many traditional areas of space research into a single focus. And when you take that broad scientific motivation, uh, mindset, you'll find out that it actually there's a lot more deeper understanding that comes from this, and it's, it's, it's a deeper connection than is anything portrayed by Hollywood. So you might have seen the movie Gravity, right? It's uh, sort of the uh, space debris equivalent of Armageddon. So if anybody works in asteroids, everybody thinks that they some, know something about Armageddon, which was, I believe, Eper's, uh, Roper's uh, review was one of the worst films ever, an insult on the eyes, the ears, the human desire to be entertained. Uh, so uh, in fact, when I talk to people about what I do, I say it's a combination of gravity, the movie Gravity, the movie Armageddon, but it's 99% office space. It's pretty much bureaucracy. Um, but uh, I will talk mostly about those 1% here. So in fact, there's a, uh, there's a deep parallel to understanding the Earth's orbiting problem and that of the asteroids, how we track uh, and, and discover them, how we uh, uh, understand their motion. Uh, and in fact, even though the latter are all man-made, so we put them there, we know what they're made out of, 
we know where they're launched, but we seem to forget uh, after we after we put them up. So, um, so having this uh, the, these three sort of four areas here, the mo main focus of my talk today is going to be on space debris uh, mitigation. Okay, so we're facing an increasingly uh, complex and crowded environment, uh, and it's really brought up the rise of a, a new area, space traffic management. And it turns out that we already know that current SSA capabilities cannot track every piece of debris that is harmful, uh, and future technologies like the space fence will yield an unprecedented view of the debris field, but more sensors alone does not imply better SSA. Uh, and in fact, the prediction is key. Uh, and you can see here, uh, this is a, a two major uh, space events. So this is all the objects that are in orbit that are in the catalog uh, over time so from 19, uh, yes? Everything is, that's tracked is above about a softball size, so 10 centimeters. Yeah. Uh, and, and here, yeah, oh yeah, sorry. Sorry, if you guys have questions during the slides, please interrupt. Don't, yeah. Um, so here you can see this is the trend of all objects. Here's the fragmentation debris. Okay, so these are smaller, smaller objects. Then you have the spacecraft, mission related debris, and rocket bodies. So this is something that is, uh, if you go to the NASA Orbital Debris Program Office, they have this uh, news quarterly update. And uh, so every three months or so, uh, they provide a new chart like this. So I haven't updated this slide in a long time. <laughs> anyway, uh, so you can see a number of events. Uh, this one probably uh, Michael can tell you a lot about that. That's the uh, ASAT test. So that was an intentional destruction of a satellite by China. That was done in an altitude that was uh, too high so that these objects are not going to come down for a couple centuries um, due to atmospheric drag will slowly uh, will slowly cause them to lose energy and eventually they're going to burn up in the atmosphere. But if you, if you blow your satellite up at the altitude that it was done, uh, forget the altitude of Rydian Cosmos, 800 kilometers, uh, those, those pieces of debris will not come down. Uh, the other big spike occurred in February 10th, 2009. That was the Iridium Cosmos collision. So that was the first uh, collision between two intact satellites. There has been a debris hitting a piece of uh, a satellite before. Uh, several times. So this is the first large-scale collision between two um, intact one. Yeah, so Iridium is a uh, U.S. company. It's a communication uh, company, and Cosmos is a Russian uh, spy satellite. Uh, it's uh, defunct, so it's, uh, it's basically debris. Iridium was operational, and what happens is operational satellites have to commonly do what we call station-keeping maneuvers to keep their orbit, uh, keep them, uh, their orbit in place. And uh, in fact, those station keeping maneuvers, when you do that, you change your orbital state. That information needs to come back to the people who are doing the predictions to make sure that your new state doesn't interfere with another state. <laughs> two states together um, causes a, a, this kind of a, an event. And it turns out, and I'm not sure if this is true, I haven't tracked it down, but somebody has told me that Iridium maneuvered into that collision. They maneuvered that day, it didn't get uh, relayed fast enough, or maybe the prediction accuracy wasn't good enough, and it actually in, ended up in a collision. But if you take a look at the predictions that were made before this, using all the catalogs, so there's about 14,000 objects when, that, when Iridium and Cosmos collided, uh, it was not even on the top 100 list of, of potential collisions. So it was completely, even though it seems to be completely predictable, space is the most predictable thing, uh, orbital motion in space uh, compared to anything else, and you get a very, very high precision in your predictions, but we couldn't predict the Iridium Cosmos with the information given. Now, it could have been an issue also with the, the, the observations we have. That's why we need Aaron to, to get some better observations for us. Yes? Uh, why'd the number go down in 1990? So you're seeing this one? Yeah. Uh, so that's tied to the solar cycle. So, uh, you know, when the, w there's an 11-year solar cycle and, and basically the atmosphere will either be more dense or less, and that can cause uh, the smaller pieces of objects to re-enter. And that's why you see some of those. Okay. Uh, if you take this guy now and we take all these objects and we project it future, uh, into the future with the current, uh, current space traffic that we know, so current launch rates, uh, we, get a, we get an image that looks like this. Uh, and basically, this is now a famous chart by uh, J.C. Liu of NASA Debris Program Office that states, it is, necessarily, it is necessary now to deorbit five large objects from the most densely populated regions in order to keep the orbital environment stable. So this is five objects, I think, per year. 
Um, and, and this is so that we can prevent this exponential growth. And now this is assuming we have a 90% post-mitigation disposal compliance. We're at about a 10%. Um, so if uh, we do all the mitigation required, that is we passivate our satellites, we deorbit them within 25 years, which is the current rule for low Earth orbiting satellites, even then we still have to actively remove objects as the current uh, paradigm. So this is really seen as the only viable option to prevent what we call the Kessler syndrome. So the Kessler syndrome is what was dramatized by that terrible movie, Gravity, um, that now people just associate me to. Uh, so the population is already above this critical density. There's been a number of ideas for how we can actively remove objects. Some of these look very sci-fi-like. Very, uh, sci um, it turns out you can shine kind of photon, you know, like shine uh, sort of photon pressure at something and it actually will, will maneuver it. So we actually have solar sails that take advantage of the, of the momentum transfer that you get from the sun's rays. Uh, you have lasers as well, uh, ideas for that, nets, harpoons, uh, physically grappling it. But you think about it, objects that are debris, they tumble. And in fact, we don't have any observational data about the tumbling rate. So things can turn over on themselves, you know, several revolutions a minute in space and uh, try grappling with that, right? Try to take a spacecraft, you have to match its orbit. If you've ever seen the movie Interstellar, when he docked with it, right, he had to match the, the rotation of it. Um, so that's one of the major challenges. Um, there is a huge initiative in uh, Australia uh, under the uh, Space Environment Research Center CERC program. Uh, they've actually invested something on the order of $60 million to do some fundamental research in using ground-based laser photon pressure to actually not deorbit objects and not oblate them. It's not powerful. It's not like Austin Powers, right? It's not going to blow this satellite up, which is actually not a good thing, as we saw from uh, <laughs> the ASAT test. But it's going to basically just m slightly nudge it, you know? So this little laser is 10, uh, I think it's 10 kilowatts. If you, if you hit the orbit, if you hit the object here, its original orbit was going to be this guy, so its original trajectory is here. But if we, if we nudge it, at this point, we're going to get a perturbed orbit, and if there was a collision predicted to occur here, we would have avoided that collision. And that's the only way you're going to actually avoid collisions between two defunct objects that don't have any ability to maneuver. Turns out of the catalog, right, if you look at the whole catalog, there's only about 1,700 satellites that actually have maneuvering capabilities of the 20,000 that are tracked. So uh, I said this early on, uh, I think from an astronomics point of view, the proliferation of space debris is a great thing. Uh, and in fact, it's uh, motivated more deeper understanding of the uh, dynamical environments in which these objects reside. And a result of this has been a new paradigm uh, in uh, post-mission disposal, uh, which is what we call um, passive debris removal using resonances and instabilities. So it's using an idea that goes back to the asteroid belt, which I'll talk about here. Uh, and what we want to do is either find all the natural forces, gravity from the sun, the moon, all the Earth's different gravitational harmonics, so the shape of the Earth, the densities in, in the Earth, and you have the radiation pressure, atmospheric tracks, so you have all these different forces acting on these space objects. They change those orbits. So if you, want, if you try to put it something in a graveyard, which is, so you think you, you want to have like a sort of a great, you know, Pacific Ocean, what's garbage patch, the ocean gyres, you try to put something in a graveyard, well, these satellites actually come back from the graveyard, typically. Uh, and also, your, your is starting to be studied, other, other exotic forces that are causing them to spin up, and then they shed off other pieces of objects. I think you could go into more detail about what is really meant by the graveyard. Yeah, so, it, so here, yeah, so this is uh, sort of how we characterize space as this altitude classification. So we have low Earth orbit here, and low Earth orbit's about 2,000 kilometers, and that's where the atmosphere basically extends. Things left there will come back eventually. Now, higher altitudes, it takes longer time. Between uh, LEO and GEO, because we uh, are not very creative, we give it the name medium Earth orbit. Um, so it's a huge region of space. Uh, I think uh, it's sort of inappropriate to classify everything between that as just medium. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have the geosynchronous uh, middle Earth orbit, is what I've heard as well. Uh, and then we have the geosynchronous Earth orbit, which is where the, uh, uh, the satellite's orbital period is exactly one sidereal day so that if it's unperturbed, it would actually just match the rotation rate of the Earth to stay above some sort of uh, position. And actually, that's the most you know, normal, what we can think of as our airspace, is the geo belt, right? Because it's above the countries. It's above, it's in the equatorial plane, but it's the one that stays in that region. So uh, the geo is a very important region. Leo, of course, with sun synchronous orbits. A lot of these 
there's a lot of, space is big, right? But the orbital zones we use are not. So we actually use only a very small number of types of orbits. Um, about as clever as using the medium Earth orbit just to designate an entire region. But what happens in geo, because there's no atmospheric drag, is they just push them out further and leave them there. Uh, and this is the, the compliance to this, I think, is about in the order of 10%, although you might be able to tell me the numbers better. No? But it's uh, essentially just a couple hundred kilometers above the, the, the geo belt itself. And uh, what we're finding re more recently in the last decade is that there's uh, some zombie satellites coming back from there. Uh, these guys are shedding off multi-layer insulation, so it's what's used to protect the spacecraft. That's kind of shedding off and becoming what we call hammer debris, higher to mass ratio objects. And now these objects are very highly perturbed by the sun's solar radiation pressure, so they come back and, and have very, uh, from circular orbits, which if you have two circular orbits, they're never going to intersect. One's in, inside the other. But once one of those orbits become uh, elliptical, you have intersections, and that can be a problem for collisions. So that's what's uh, so some of the things happening out in these graveyards. Now, uh, in medium Earth orbit, there's something called the GPS satellites, which you guys all probably use. I had to use it just to walk back here uh, from the coffee shop. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty sad. Um, anyway, so, uh, you know, GPS satellites are all launched about four to five Earth radii in distance. So that's uh, the sort of the main objects that are in MEO, uh, MEO, MEO being medium Earth orbit. And uh, we've adopted the graveyard strategy of uh, GEO for the MEOs. And it turns out that that's a very bad strategy, and we'll see why here in a bit. Uh, the other idea here is to, so if we take all of the forces, though, we can define stable graveyards so that even if they're shedding hammers, everything, you know, these higher to mass ratio debris or anything else happens, a collision happens in the graveyards, that debris is sort of contained there uh, in, in, in a dynamical fashion because of the natural forces. Uh, and that's one of the drivers of this research. The other one is how to surf and navigate what we call phase space, so navigate uh, the, the space around the Earth uh, and actually use those to, to sort of... Uh, get rid of satellites, okay? So I'll talk about these, uh, these two areas. Uh, I'm happy to note that the uh, passive debris removal, although it sounds very sort of, uh, you know, um, sounds like it's not a very viable option, right? You have to wait for a long time for the gravity of the moon or the sun to cause your orbits to uh, re-enter, but it, it is, does have a practical uh, um, uh, time scales that you can use, and it actually made its way into the new updated standards uh, for the debris mitigation by the United States. So this was a recent, uh, I think this is after 20 years, they finally changed the uh, mitigation policy. Um, these are non-binding though, so nobody has to really do this, but it's uh, <laughs> suggested. Um, one of the rules that was never changed in that update was what we call the 25 year decay rule. So objects in this low earth part have 25 years at the end of their life to get, to get back into the earth. Uh, and uh, with the launch of these mega constellations, we're seeing that that is not a, a very good number. We need something on the order of five years, or else those mega constellation satellites, which are generally above the rest of the debris field, 25 years will be passing through it. Uh, and with the amount of satellites that they're going to launch, that's going to be a pretty big problem. What's, what's the typical lifetime? Oh, functioning lifetime used to be on the order of 10 years. Uh, they're pushing that limit. It can, you know. There's been satellites that are operational for 20 years now, even longer. I'm not quite sure the exact number, but uh, I think the mega constellation satellites have a, I think they might have a life five years was what they want, 10 maybe? I don't know. Not quite sure. Those are two practical questions. I know the dynamical life. Yes? Right. 10 years, but some of them will be dead on arrival. Um, that happened with 10% of SpaceX's uh, last launch. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and with Starlight, of, Starlink. One of the concerns um, that, that one of our previous speakers had was that the consumer economics model of, um, of, of essentially building, building things and then moving on to the next generation very quickly with very cheaply made products could end up being more Yeah. Yeah. So if you think about, uh, you know, launching, they're just basically launching debris <laughs> into space. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about the mega constellations uh, uh, later on. Um, but um, 
So typical dynamical lifetimes in the geosynchronous region that, that this here, uh, people had commonly thought that things launched there will last forever. Um, they will never come back because there's no dissipation. But it turns out that's not entirely true. Uh, and also in uh, MEO, the lifetimes are not forever. You can get back down uh, from geo in 10 years if, you, uh, if you're at the right inclination. And I'll talk about how that can be achieved through this mechanism here. Okay, so uh, before we get into this, there's a number of, I'll try not to go through too much of the math. I can see you guys all probably love mathematics as much as I do. Um, so I'll just want to highlight a few of the symbols because these are used in a number of the slides. So this is how we classify orbits in terms of not positional velocity space, but we classify them in terms of orbital element space. And this is the semi-major axis. So I have a little video here uh, that shows what this means. So the semi-major axis is related to the energy, and it's the orbit's size. Uh, next, we have the eccentricity, which is, uh, is the orbit's shape, okay? uh, uh, deviation from a circle. And then we have uh, the inclination, which is the tilt. Uh, and then we have another uh, two angles that also, these three angles here are classically referred to as the Euler angles for, the, for the, this kind of thing. But uh, this gives you the orientation. These three angles together give you the orientation of the orbit in inertial space. Okay? And then this last one here, this true anomaly, that actually locates where the satellite is within its orbit. So this last guy here is the actual position of it. So you, we'll go into a little bit of this. So it turns out that um, the Earth is not a sphere. So uh, the flat Earthers were sort of right. Uh, but it is, in fact, more <laughs> like a, uh, um, uh, it's more like an oblate uh, spheroid. And uh, so it's, it's crushed down. Uh, at its poles, flattened at its poles, and it's wider at the equator. And that's what we call the dynamical oblateness, the J2. And that's one of the dominant perturbations on satellites. And what that does is it causes these two angles, these two omega angles here, to actually uh, to change, to, to, to regress or process. So they either rotate forward or rotate opposite sense of the, of the path of the orbit. Uh, that's one of the dominant forces. You also have atmospheric drag, but of course that for force falls off after you, as you get further away from the Earth. We have the moon and the sun. Uh, they actually are very, traditionally, they've been considered very weak forces, but you can see that they're of order J2 once you get out to the geo region. So they're quite uh, an important force there. And in fact, even though they're not the same order as J2, there can be certain regions where they can be the strongest force. And they can be leveraged to actually change the orbit in such a way that it gets rid of it. Uh, then you have a bunch of other uh, forces as well. These are sort of the main ones. Relative to, yes. And then you have the altitude over and on the top, that's in the center uh -huh. of the Earth. And then so you're just comparing that VM there. That's, that's just gravity, standard gravity. And then you have your different perturbations associated with it as you, as you go down. One is the perturbation from the moon. And you have the perturbation from the sun. And you have yeah, the perturbation see. from the oblateness of the Earth. And you have the solar radiation pressure. You can see this is for a typical satellite. It's not a very strong force. So most of it's a gravitational Thing. Now, it gets stronger with, with increasing area to mass ratio. So if your, your objects are like a solar sail, then this is a, a very strong force. So you can think about um, uh, the difference that a uh, CubeSat would have with this force versus like uh, one of the, the Starlink, uh, Starlight, Starlight, Starlink. What is it? Starlink, Starlink satellites. OK. Sorry, one more thing that I typically might point out. You see atmospheric drag the way it Drops, falls yeah. Off. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what I, so you can see that there basically there's this is an entire conservative regime outside of that. So there's no dissipation. There's no natural dissipation me dissipative mechanism that's going to bring satellites down after about 2,000 kilometers. Um, okay, so uh, how do we? Um, uh, this is one of the biggest, uh, I think. Uh, parallels that, that have been made in the, the fields of asteroid dynamics and uh, satellite dynamics. And it's something that is, uh, you know, to, to really motivate this idea of how you can um, use instabilities and where those instabilities come from, our understanding of the paucity of objects, uh, or sorry, our understanding of, of, of dynamical clearing of certain orbits comes from uh, this um, 30, 40 years of studies done on understanding what we call the Kirkwood gap. So this is a paucity uh, in the uh, uh, the distribution of asteroids. So this is distance from the sun. 
Uh, this is their orbital inclinations, but you can also have the eccentricities on that, that, that axis as well. But you see that there is noticeable structure here. Okay, so there's, uh, there's, there's like a, a lines here that where you don't have any asteroids uh, compared to the other ones, uh, the other distributions. So this is, this would have been a planet, right? Had uh, Jupiter not been there, right? It would have formed into a planet, I think. That's what the thought was. Um, so this is between Mars and Jupiter, the asteroid belt, and you have these uh, areas where there is a great paucity of objects. Now this area is actually where we call uh, certain configurations resonances. So these are commensurabilities. This is when you have like um, the orbital period of the asteroid uh, is uh, some integer ratio of the orbital period of Jupiter. So the asteroid is rotating four times around the sun every one orbit of Jupiter. Um, so uh, we also have another substructure on this map which is caused by uh, secular resonance. So these are a little bit more exotic to explain, so I'll try not to. Uh, but the whole idea here is that uh, the instabilities that we see in the asteroid belt come from this idea called Cherikov's resonant overlap criteria. And that's when you have these resonances, which we think of as a mathematical quantity, as kind of these uh, pendulums, uh, maybe too technical, <laughs> pendulums in the phase space. Yes. Yeah, maybe the child swing so, analogy. Yeah, the child swing that's yeah. good for the mean motion. So the secular, think of hitting a bell, and the bell starts vibrating creating the sound that's coming through. And that, you can decompose that into very, into these certain uh, kind of frequencies that are all combined to, to make the sound that you hear. And um, you have from the, you have certain, if, if you hit some of those modes, then it, some fun things can actually happen with the way you bring things. Like when you think about taking a glass and going around the mm -hmm. room, if you do it the right way, you So in dynamics, in a very imperfect analogy is to say that your planetary system is kind of like one of these bells. Mm -hmm. And if you can get certain situations to cause it to ring, then fun things happen. And that's what those secular resonances are. They're not as striking as the swing analogy that you just did. I'll let you go. That's good. I'm going to write this down. I like the... Or you also think of the bridge, right? So the bridge when it's vibrating at its natural frequency. Um, I, re I think I read in a, in a dynamical astronomer paper that they said everybody knows when you push a child's swing at its natural frequency. <laughs> I'm like, no, they don't. <laughs> but the, the idea is that you know, if, you, if you push randomly the, sh the swing, you know, you're not going to really go anywhere. You know, this is going to keep canceling out. But you can think of systematically if you keep pushing it, at its natural frequency, you're going to keep getting higher, right? Uh, and that's kind of the idea is that we're trying to push, or actually we're not trying, and this is nature. Nature did this in a way that it uh, systematically cleared out these zones that uh, we call now the Kirkwood gaps. And it was, I think, identified by Kirkwood even when there wasn't that many asteroids that were, were discovered at the time. So it's a pretty robust form of chaos, and it's been used to, to explain the orbital architecture of, of uh, a number of astronomical systems from small bodies to, uh, to uh, exoplanets, the distribution of, of, of other planets around other stars. Uh, and the whole idea here is that you get a bunch of overlapping uh, these guys and you, you excite that uh, specific tone, right? And what happens is your eccentricity eventually gets pumped up to a value that allows it to cross with the other planets and then you eventually get collisions. So the millions of years that you, you, you look at the evolutions, uh, of these, uh, the, the time spans that these objects have existed since the, the you know, creation of the, of the solar system, uh, essentially these guys would have been ejected a long time ago. Yes? So Jupiter is sitting there pushing. The, yeah. The asteroid's the child. It's yeah. pushing it. And then it's not a very instead good. of just going back and forth, eventually the sibling lunge in, the, in front. Yeah. They hit each other. It's not a good. Now the child's off the swing. Yeah, it's not, Jupiter's not a good father. Yeah. So yeah, basically. Uh, <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah, so Jupiter, Jupiter uh, got rid of a lot of its uh, children this way. Um, and uh, there's a really nice paper, I think, uh, by Rosemary Mardling. She's, uh, she's an Austra Australian astronomer, and I think this is a nice paper that summarizes this idea. Um, I think they also probably use the child swing analogy. Uh, if you go look at the distribution of objects, uh, the catalog, so this, you know, the way we typically look at objects is not in their you know, actual space, we look at them in something we call phase space, so in some, some, you know, 
some plane of those orbital elements. And this is the plane of the distance. So this happens to be like semi-major axis. And so the shape, the size, sorry, the orbit size, and this is the tilt. Uh, we do the same thing with uh, space debris, okay, and, and the things in the catalog. And we don't get such a, a beautiful structure that we see in the asteroid belt. Uh, and uh, there's a number of differences, but so this here uh, on the x-axis is the distance from the Earth in Earth radii, and I have the, the revolutions per day on the top so you can get an idea. So that means that LEO objects revolve around the Earth about 17 times uh, per day. Of course, GEO is here. It has a revolution of just one per day, um, and that's directly a function of the semi-major axis, okay, the, the orbital period is. Now you have the eccentricity here, so the, the size sorry, the, the orbit shape, deviation from a circle, and you have the tilt. If you look at this, you can identify a number of objects that we use, uh, sun synchronous being the, one of the most popular ones, also geostationary, we have a number of objects there. Typically, these guys have a similar orbital characteristic, so these guys are all at uh, very, very high inclinations. Uh, and high inclinations, uh, um, when you have a bunch of different in high inclinations, you can actually get collisions more often than, than not. If you're all orbiting and ca crossing the pole, let's say, then you're all going to eventually, all, no matter what, how, you, how you maneuver the orbits around the Earth in their, um, in their node, in, the, in the, uh, the, the other type of tilt that you can do, you'll still, get, you'll still get intersections. And this is a big thing for also the mega constellations, as we'll see. So the, uh, this is the, the small region. The, this is the, between here and here is what we call MEO. This is where we have a lot of our satellites that uh, do the uh, G and SS. This is GTO. Anybody know what GTO is? Besides Aaron? Yep. So this is how we get to GEO. So what happens to these GTOs? Well, these are just rocket bodies. We leave them there. So these are the, the things that get us to that GEO, and they stay pretty much in different uh, bands of inclination. Now, the, the reason there's different bands of inclination is because that's directly tied to the launch site latitude. That kind of gives you where you're going to be inclined, wh where you're going to be at in orbit, because you launch directly into that that orbit. So, Can I make a quick comment? Yep. On that? Uh, he showed the plot that showed uh, how the debris had accumulated. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting to think about where all the mass is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so all the mass is, <laughs> actually, most of the mass is in this GTO region, because it's the big rocket bodies. Yeah. Uh, you can see also that these guys have very highly high inclinations as well. Geo are the inclination of, of, of zero because they want to, they're basically above the equator, and that's the region where they can stay stationary. So we call it geostationary orbits. Uh, uh, GNSS satellites are mostly circular, uh, and what happens is you have a bunch of objects out here. Uh, this is all the GNSS. I, think, I, don't, I guess I don't have the zoom here. Uh, this is four different constellations of uh, satellites. So there's the GPS. For the Americans, there's the GLONASS, uh, the Russian system, the Baidu is the, or Beidou is the new one for China, and we have uh, Galileo for the uh, Europeans. And GPS, or sorry, GNSS and GLONASS being the, the oldest ones, uh, most of the other, uh, you know, the newer systems adopted the same orbit design pretty much as the GPS, even though that design might not have been the best choice. Uh, and I'll talk about why. So these guys are at high inclinations, very circular orbits, and uh, when, they're, when they're decommissioned, they just push them out. But now that there's four cons different constellations there, they can't push them so far out, and they can't push them in. They have to be careful because you don't want to intersect with the other guys, so you want to stay away from the other operational zones. So uh, just like the, the, the bell and this child swing analogy, it turns out that all the different frequencies that we have uh, in the uh, Earth environment, uh, so we have a bunch of different um, periods that we, we, we think of. So the common one is the earthly day. We also have the lunar month, the, the year, the solar year. Uh, various precession frequencies, so ranging from a few years to nearly 26,000 years for the equinox. So that's, that's the precession of the Earth's pole. So that's the fact is in 26,000 years, the Earth's pole would complete one revolution. Uh, and this is exactly why everybody follows the wrong horoscope, right? Because they were established... 2,500 years ago, and that means that the Earth has completed about, um, it's completed about 30, 30 degrees uh, uh, of revolution, and so now it's uh, the background stars, the background constellations shifted by one month, but I am still a Leo, because I was at the cutoff. <laughs> um, 
no, true. Uh, but yeah, so this is uh, tied to the Milankovitch. So all these different frequencies, though, can give rise to different uh, resonant effects. Uh, and then the most common one, and the one that has been studied for a number of years, is what we call tesseral ones. So the fact that the Earth uh, is not a sphere, but there's a bunch of different uh, gravity coefficients that represent the mass and the shape at those uh, various locations on the Earth. Uh, these give rise to a resonance in, uh, that you, we think about as this in, in, in phase space as this kind of pendulum thing. When you get a number of these different guys intersecting, you start to get this, uh, actually at MEO, you start to get uh, instability. And this is measured here in a kind of stability map that a lot of people use to sort of characterize what regions are stable. And I'll, I'll give a little bit more information on how we can interpret this, but what you see here is that yellow is means that the orbits are chaotic, or that they will essentially uh, deviate from other from their their initial position more rapidly than any other orbit. So orbits here typically are what we call stable; they will stay in that region uh, forever. But orbits in this other one will kind of expand and go along the sea. Now this is instability, though, in the semi-major axis is very narrow, so it doesn't really cause a gross gross change in the location of these satellites, but the GNSS satellites are by design uh, located in uh, chaotic orbits in the tesseral harmonics. Now that's not a problem though. Uh, there's another type of resonance, the most important one being secular, okay, uh, and this one uh, is caused by the fact that the sun perturbs the moon. Okay, so the perturbation of the sun on the moon induces a new perturbation on the orbits of artificial satellites. And in fact, as you, uh, as you recede from the Earth, to the geo region, you get something that looks stable, this is a very nice picture, to something that looks very chaotic. Uh, and uh, the only people I think who had ever understood this before our modern era have been the, the former Soviet Union, because they have always selected <laughs> the small stable region to place their Molniya satellites. And the Molniyas are the ones you think about that uh, have this very nice property. They're very eccentric and uh, inclined, and what they do is they spend most of their time spying on America and Canada, <laughs> right? And then, uh, and then they come back really fast, rapidly through here, and then they uh, relay that to uh, Siberia. So it's a very nice uh, communication satellite for them. And you can imagine that the, uh, the, the orientation of the orbit's very important. And so by putting it in this uh, sort of zone here, you can kind of freeze uh, aspects of its orbit and keep it in that beautiful configuration. Okay, so uh, there has been a, a lot of numerical studies done over the last two decades to, uh, uh, on the uh, GPS satellites. How am I doing in time? Uh, 10 minutes? Oh, really? Oh, shoot. Okay. Well, well we also ended up with the last two, so we could just be maybe 10 minutes in the next of discussion. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, uh, so. Uh, there's something uh, has been discovered recently is not just the fact that this sort of uh, instability, which has been widely, sorry, this one here that's been widely known for a long time, there's actually another instability in the MIA region and it causes a bigger change and that changes in the eccentricities of the orbit. So this time scale is a, you know, several, uh, several centuries here and uh, the thing is, is after, after 100 years or so, uh, the eccentricities start to get very high, uh, depending on uh, the, the date that you launch, depending on certain characteristics. Uh, and this is bad because any, and the eccentricity gets above really very small values, 0 0.02, so almost nothing, you know, close to zero, it was almost a circle, that intersects with the other operational zone. So that is the threshold for a graveyard, that eccentricity can't exceed 0 0.02, and that happens actually after a couple decades, and we actually see the uh, manifestation of this in current GPS uh, satellites that are in their graveyards, which are not such graveyards. Uh, the GLONASS are actually a little bit better, uh, better place, but you can see that there's a very precise inclination of these satellites, 56 degrees, 65 degrees. Um, these are not the best choices of inclination because they are exactly on the locations of where the bell rings, right? Where the bell tolls, from the bell tolls. Uh, so anyway, this whole idea here is, uh, was captured in this uh, paper on how the navigation satellites are actually unstable, uh, which is due to what we call secular chaos. Uh, it turns out that there's a close analogy between that uh, dynamical problem and the, the, how the terrestrial planets, so how the Earth will, um, uh, the, how is Mars, no, is Mars is the one chaotic or Mercury? Uh, Mercury. Mercury. Mercury will eventually, yeah. Right. There's like a few percent, no, it's about two percent chance that uh, over the lifetime of the solar system, Mercury, Mercury will go on to 
<laughs> yeah, so the same, the same dynamics that cause Mercury to ruin people's day is also causing the GPS satellites to, um, to, to change in their, their orbits. And, and the, it's kind of an irony because navigation satellites, their whole principal purpose is to give you know, accurate position timing and, and navigation, right, on Earth. And, we, you know, and then they themselves, they can't actually predict their own motion <laughs> because of this phenomenon. So this has been done, a lot of work has been done in this area for a long time, but this idea of secular chaos is kind of novel in the field of celestial mechanics. There's not many works on it, uh, but the analogy with, uh, yeah, I'm going to skip these. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is how you oh, studied the problem. <laughs> I'm going to skip this, but uh, I want to say something. So when you look at the problem, you have these exotic uh, mini summations of, of terms and functions of the orbital elements of the bodies that are perturbing and the, the body that is being perturbed, uh, and you make some approximations. I really didn't know what. what you were saying, though, at the beginning. Like, yes. Uh, whether you know, it's being useful going to one more value of right. Right, right. So, so, so this, this is the ratio of the semi-major axes. So it's the ratio of the, and you think about it, the Earth's, the, most of our orbits around Earth are about seven Earth radii away, less than seven Earth radii. The moon is at 59. Uh, so that ratio is a, about almost, you know, 10, 10% or so. Um, so it's uh, point 0.1. So you don't really need to take this expansion to like 100 terms, right? You can truncate that. And it turns out you can truncate it just at the second order one get a pretty nice approximation of the dynamics. And this is important because if you're trying to study all those frequencies, uh, you, get, you get a lot, a big reduction in them once you truncate that first term. Okay, let's skip that. But the whole idea here is that uh, in celestial mechanics, you deal with this nasty uh, thing we call the Hamiltonian. Uh, and I'm from the University of Arizona, so we have a mascot, the wildcat. So you deal with this nasty wildcat. Uh, and you take this, you know, complicated mathematical formulation, and what you do is you do this, you know, some trickery here, and I'm going to call it the uh, canonical Boley transformation because he's the one who probably understands this in the room. And what you do is you try to massage that that Hamiltonian and then tame that cat. You know, you try to make it into something you can actually understand analytically, or else the, you know, you can't really get much far with this. And the idea is that you want to reduce that thing into something that's a lower dimension. Uh, what we call one degree of freedom system, so that we have those beautiful pendulum structures. Uh, it turns out, though, that for these uh, problems for Earth, those are not quite pendulums. Uh, they have a different, they can't be reduced in this way easily. They have a different sort of structure. You can see a kind of bifurcation happening here. Uh, and it turns out that it's a little bit harder, so pushing the cat analogy further. <laughs> Uh, so if you take that and you, you map out now all these zones, this is where all the, this is where all the beautiful uh, intersections of all those resonances occur. And this is where, in the intersections of these, is where we expect to have chaotic orbits. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and so if you, if you look, this is from three Earth radii all the way up to about five. This is a, actually, this is the different, um, sorry, this is the different uh, altitudes of the navigation satellite systems. Um, no, actually, no, it's not. These two are. Uh, so anyway, it goes from three there. You can see that these, this, this sort of what we call a resonance web, sort of spider web of, of resonance, this sort of expands out and intersects and becomes a very, bit more complicated as we get to the, the middle of MEO at uh, five Earth radii. And uh, the importance of this is that you can see that if you put orbits, so if you start an initial satellite here, Typically, we orbit with zero eccentricity, our satellites. This guy will eventually climb the web, you know, and it'll get diffusing up to high eccentricities, and that means that it intersects with other, um, other satellites and other regions, and also it can actually get to such a high value that it re-enters. Okay? Uh, and uh, this is another view of that web with a couple other nice resonances that come from another, other frequencies that we consider. Uh, it turns out that if you look at this web and you look exactly where they placed all the navigation systems, they put them in exactly the spot on the web where you have intersections of multiple lines. And so that leads to this complicated sort of phase space type stuff. And uh, what you have in this, again, yellow is bad. That means it's unstable. And you get the location of all the satellites, which are placed mainly at 56 degrees and 63 degrees. That's the critical one. Uh, that there's a gross instability here, and it goes all the way out to geo. So in fact, if I launch something in geo with an inclination between 40 degrees and 140, anything above 90 degrees is retrograde, so it orbits opposite the direction of the Earth, uh, those guys will come back. Okay? 
Uh, and the interesting thing about this is that you might have heard of the Sirius constellation. Wasn't that a Canadian Sirius? Con it was satellite radio. Was it Canadian? Yeah. So they were launched at high geo, high inclination geo. Not many orbits are, are done that, but Beidou is, one, uh, is the other one. Beidou's navigation component has a geo, uh, sorry, navigation system has a geo component. Now they were launched at one of these high inclinations, and they tried to be good stewards of space by deorbiting, not deorbiting, but by maneuvering into a graveyard. So they actually spent a significant amount of fuel to lower their semi-major axis to upper MEO. Okay, so they got out of the region. So this is the typical geo, all the geo satellites. This is the few satellites that are, that are at these high inclinations. Now these guys actually got to, into this region that is uh, blue here. Let's say this is a different kind of map. But, and what they could have done though, had they studied the, the dynamics for a longer time span, they could have just stayed there. And in 10 years, that object would have been out of space for good. Um, so if they had just left it there, it would have cleaned itself. Um, and they can also take advantage of that by designing. So Beidou, Beidou's navigation component can be designed a priori to clean itself after its end of life. So it doesn't have to go into a graveyard. It can come back. Uh, of course, the collision probability is, is actually quite, uh, you won't get as high of, um, well, I, I actually can't say much about that. I was going to say the collision probability is less because it's inclined orbit, but you have to actually study the each problem in detail. So I think the collision probability of re-entering for this object is very, very low lower than current con collision probabilities between objects in, in the region itself. Okay, so if we take this idea to the mega constellation, so this is a picture of, uh, of the debris field, and this is the MEO component of the, the mega constellation, and then this is a LEO one. This is for OneWeb. I think these numbers, uh, these numbers for OneWeb are accurate, but I think the ones for SpaceX have changed. I think SpaceX wants to launch, I don't know, 10,000 satellites. Now, Boeing dropped off the game. Amazon got on, so there's now three major uh, space companies who are doing these mega constellations. SpaceX has approved for 12,000 and they've requested an additional 30,000. Right, 30,000, 42,000. So if you want to design those constellations, there's maybe regions in space where you can design them to take advantage of natural uh, reentry. Turns out that the time scales for these guys aren't so good, so this is not exactly a viable option for uh, them, but they haven't all been studied in detail. Every one of these lines need to be studied with that cat analogy. You gotta take that nasty guy and do that analogy, do that massaging to get it into something you can understand. So we don't really understand the implications of all these, but some numerical studies that have been done show that it's not as feasible because the time scales take too long. Okay, let me just speed this up here. This is the way we study it. Um, that's too complicated. Uh, this is uh, the, one of the papers that came out that showed that as you go from the Earth to MEO, you go from stability of orbits to a gross instability on account of those, uh, that resonant web. And, and this paper was in uh, one of the main journals uh, of, of celestial mechanics. And uh, it was uh, selected for the Selmec article uh, prize, which is a, a nice designation. It was also nominated by Springer Nature as uh, one of the 180 groundbreaking articles that'll help change the world. I don't know if it'll change the world. It's only been read by like five people, but uh, <laughs> understood by three. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I think it's a nice, uh, it's nice that uh, they, they gave it that, that designation. Um, but what happens is, is uh, you can do these very cool um, stability maps in the certain phase space, so in orbital element space, and you see a nice pendulum here. As you, go to, uh, as you go to where we have our uh, navigation satellites, you get this gross chaotic region, which is not quite good. Uh, and this is sort of uh, uh, taking that whole holistic perspective from Leo to Geo and trying to map out all of the instabilities that you would have around the Earth. Um, I'm gonna fly through these slides because I wanna talk about the mega constellation stuff at the end. Yeah, no, or, or, um, this is a, maybe this is more. I prefer that, I, we're, we're, we should probably move on to some discussion. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, this is uh, Archie Roy was a astronomy professor at Glasgow, a uh, big, big guy in the field. He once wrote that there's no new results in celestial mechanics. There are only those who don't read the early literature. Uh, Zeba Hay said in the several, several hundred year old subject of celestial mechanics, a reference to a seemingly new idea can almost always be located in the early literature. Uh, and the point is, of course, what happened to the development of the idea. This idea that we can actually deorbit by resonances was known in the 50s, but forgotten, I guess. Uh, and our first satellite that we launched into a highly eccentric orbit, Explorer, uh, Explorer 6, the Paddlewheel satellite, um, 
So it's, uh, it's launched uh, in uh, four Earth radii, so about the region of NEO. Uh, it's got a high eccentricity. It's a nice old time <laughs> diagram of an orbit. Uh, and uh, well, it's an another interesting fact that Michael might appreciate is that it was the first satellite to demonstrate the capabilities of an ASAT test. Uh, and uh, they didn't actually hit the spacecraft, but they got pretty close to it. I don't think their intent was to hit it, but they, uh, they showed that they can have a ballistic impactor to do it. The other first is that it prompted a number, a number of studies by uh, uh, Kozai and Musin, and this sort of uh, harmonic analysis here where you can see the different different amplitudes and frequencies that come into play when you're looking at the evolution. So depending on the time of launch, you get drastically different evolutions. And so this one means you would, you would re-enter. Uh, and this is identified uh, more recently, you know, 40 years later, to be the strongest uh, one. It's called the apsidal resonance. And it turns out that that's the same one as the eviction, or eviction, eviction, or eviction, eviction resonance that, that drives the, the, the Earth's uh, moons evolution um, as well, no, I have that. So yeah, it's the same type of dynamical phenomenon. So you can see that uh, all these, you know, when you study the orbital motion of objects, you know, although I, I'm a space garbage man and I, I never knew I would become that, you know, when I started college, I didn't know that that's a thing you can do. Uh, you really, all the objects in space, you sort of, you know, it's just a different application of the laws of physics uh, and usually classical physics to study. And you can have a lot of analogies between things in dynamical astronomy. Okay, so uh, the last topic I want to say is that uh, we launched, so we, we knew that resonances uh, can impact the lifetime of satellites. Uh, we've known that since the, the, the early 60s, uh, and yet we forgot about it already in 64, um, because this object here is still in orbit. It was, uh, it's called uh, o, uh, the Orbital Geophysical Observatory. It was called uh, the Eccentric Geophysical Observatory by Goddard, and I call this topic, the shades of ego, because it's a bunch of different, e you know, astrodynamicists and professors in general have a high ego, so this is sort of a, a, a shock to, to, to the egos of us, because uh, we couldn't predict that it was going to, the early days, uh, they, they tried to predict the uh, evolution of this guy, and they thought it might re-enter within 18 years. Turns out it's still in orbit today, uh, and if you look at the launch characteristics of this particular satellite, this is a very complicated launch window map that I don't really understand, but there are certain regions where you can launch, and this means uh, you have certain time of, certain day, and you have a certain injection hour, and all the restraints of your satellite, so it would, you would launch and you would have a certain, you wouldn't have eclipse periods because you, you, know, you need your, your, your satellites to be charged, uh, you, you would have uh, the sun always in view, you wouldn't have the certain characteristics, um, your, your satellite would live for a certain amount of time, but this has been done in launch window studies, and if you take that and you just perturb, um, if, you take, if you take a look at this, uh, this satellite, there's another aspect I wanted to mention is that we have observations of it, a few disparate ones in the early days, that was EGO, and then it somehow appeared back in the catalog 30 years later, but we're missing in the catalog 30 years of observational data on this guy. So some poor soul at Space Command, because it is not done automa automated, if somebody actually has to go in there, back propagate and <laughs> track that that was the same object. And we actually uh, used our own tools to, to find out that that indeed was the case. Uh, we can use the TLEs for long-term prediction with the methods that we've developed. And we predict that it's going to re-enter in December 2020. So if you have your telescope by then, I'd like to use this uh, object as a, as a case study for, for that. Uh, one of the interesting things about EGO is had they just launched it 10 minutes earlier, it would have been out of orbit by now. <laughs> you know, so uh, this is kind of this, yeah, this idea of passive debris um, uh, removal, I don't think people have taken it seriously because we still haven't come up with a new name to make it really, you know, sell. But uh, it was, it did appear in the uh, new guidelines, which I'm happy about. Uh, and there's a number of researchers that have done it. Um, last slides here is uh, about the mega constellations that are going to come up. We've already said that they're going to call into question the robustness of the current debris mitigation guidelines. Um, there's a number of unknown challenges. It turns out if you look at the distribution, they selected, and I think the, the Starlink, this is the one in the FCC report, but the Starlink now is going to launch it. I think they're going to have a, a, a lower altitude for a number of their satellites. Three separate shells. But, yeah, so this is, uh, this is uh, one of their earlier designs, five different shells, and you have one web here. <laughs> just all the satellites at the same exact altitude. So you can see in reference to the number, this histogram of altitude versus number of objects in the catalog, you can see that this is higher than, drastically higher than any other regime. 
they're, but they're placed in certain locations that are sort of free of the background debris field, and that was intentional. Uh, but if you just look at the satellite constellations themselves, uh, this, was, this is one web. Uh, this is one web's LEO design. Uh, 36 uh, planes, each plane has 55 satellites in it. Uh, they're all at the same inclination, just different nodes, so they're just oriented around the Earth in a different way. But by design, that means those orbits are all going to intersect since they're at the same altitude. So if they, if all, if 10% of their satellites died, no longer had maneuvering capabilities, then they would collide with themselves. They don't have to worry about the debris field in this case. So we've taken that uh, look, closer look at this um, constellation in particular, and we said, if we, what if we use the natural perturbations as a way to design the constellation itself? And just with very mod modest tweaks, almost indistinguishable. If you look at the ground tracks, you can't see they overlap each other. Uh, but if you do this modest tweak, you can get a collision reduction almost to uh, zero. So if the satellites all died, they can stay there until we maybe go up there and bring them back down. If you so put them into this. The uh, orbits tend to intersect at the poles, like the north and south pole, where there's probably the least use and the most satellites. The, most of the satellites are launched at what we call sun synchronous orbits. Well, it, so, so if I have this, uh, if I have my whole constellation up there, the satellites, I'm going to have oh. a very high density on them oh. around the poles. Yeah, you, you, want, you, want high, you want a high inclination. Uh, because you cover more latitude in the ground track. So that's why they're designed to have high inclination, so you get a higher coverage. Because now if, you're, if your satellite's polar, the Earth's turning under, the, the satellite's in, let's say, inertial space, the, the Earth is rotating under it, so you're covering the entire Earth. And this is what this kind of ground track represents, is, is the position above the surface of the Earth on this, uh, on this mercantile projection. Um, so you can see that, yeah, high, high inclinations are important to get the coverage. So they have to be that, and that's the idea, is that they're going to have coverage internet at the poles, at the yeah, Arctic, you know? I only know it in meters per second. <laughs> Seven <laughs> meters per second, uh, which is, do a quick, I'm not good at math, actually. I'm <laughs> 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 really not. <laughs> What so if I don't have pink from through there? Yeah, so I'm seeing everything here has the same inclination. Now, if I had some of my orbits were like right around the equator, and then I had all the different inclinations, I could probably get a coverage where I had a density more around the equator where all the people were that probably wanted internet rather than like an isenograph being where I have a very high density at the poles. Yeah, population. yeah. So I'll, I'll talk to you about it later. Yeah, the I, I don't know what exactly goes into the design of these. I know, I mean. They could have a very, I mean, what, SpaceX, for instance, uh, I don't have it up here. Well, you can see the different inclinations. SpaceX chose a var variety of inclinations to get the same coverage that OneWeb would have. Um, so you can, there's a, I mean, there's not really like a constellation design book. But the point of this study is I don't know anything about constellation design myself, but if I just take the orbits and I use the natural dynamics, I can change, tweak a little bit of the properties of each of those orbits. So maybe not, not orbiting at 87 degrees inclination, but 87.001, right? And if I change the eccentricity of the orbit slightly so that what happens is the orbit becomes what we call a frozen orbit. Uh, and uh, by doing so, these orbits are very safe. And you can see that if you, if you look at the time evolution of, of conjunctions, but lower than a kilometer, which is a very, a, a very low threshold, uh, that the nominal constellation has a high number of these, whereas our, the one that we've designed, which is almost indistinguishable, goes pretty much to zero, and they never get within 500 meters from each other, whereas the nominal one would collide with each other by design. So I think that's all I have, I'll end with the quote again. Yep.